All right, gang, here we are. Uh, this is the College Credit Plus for Mr. Kretz lecture over the American Yacht Chapter 10. Uh, here we are again, 2020 style, hitting it up from the remote learning, but I'm just gonna record it and upload it and then I'll have it forever. So let's get started. Spiritual revivalism and social reform. The changes from industrialism, urbanization, and immigration led to many to search for a means to cope. Um, I've done some study over Rochester, New York, which is the picture I believe in this, uh, yeah, Upper Falls of the Genesee at Rochester, New York. So Rochester itself was like a site of this massive change. The Erie Canal comes through, brings a bunch of people and businesses, and the businesses that are focused on the countryside to begin with start to... Um, lose their importance maybe is the way to put it or maybe not lose their importance but then rochester's like ec economy shifts from relying mainly on the agriculture to having some more inner city feel to it boomtown inland and actually it was the first inland boomtown um but these prim and proper dudes that had lived there for a while i mean not a crazy long time but you know back in the 1820s and 30s maybe 15 20 years um were forced to cope with these massive changes of new people flexing, you know, coming in and out of their city. The second great awakening was a reaction to the 18th century enlightenment. Okay. And the main focus was on issues such as alcoholism, slavery, um, and inequality of women. So let's talk about the second great awakening. Um, the first great awakening is or the Great Awakening, as we call it, from, you know, a while ago or a couple a hundred or less or so years ago, like the 1700s, was a big deal. It sort of put the founding fathers of the United States in a position to, I guess, um, I'll lower my chair a little bit, start to question authority. And if the founding fathers or the Americans prior to, you know, as they were colonies, if they didn't question authority, well, they would still be serving the king. Um, and so that was a big change for them. Well, here, the Second Great Awakening sort of has another response to the changing times. And it was a response to powerful intellectual and social currents, as the book says. Um, I got my notes right here. I printed out the chapters. It's just funny, all these online courses, and here I am printing out things. Um, the Second Great Awakening remade the nation's religious landscape. Massive, there, so this Great Awakening held massive religious revivals that gave people a sense of religious order and moral order to help them struggle with the massive changes of the day. So basically, the country that they knew from a decade or two prior was changing so fast that people were searching for a means to make sense of this. And we could get into psychology and assimilation and accommodation, blah, blah, blah. But that was a very trying time, a dangerous time, a crazy time for people. Um, and, you know, maybe if you want to think, compare it to something, now it's not a, quite the same, but you could think of the coronavirus pandemic, how people are literally having to change every aspect of their life to manage this. And, and back then, this industrialization and crazy change and advancements in technology was something that people did struggle to deal with. And so it was a big deal. Now, these massive religious revivals led to a huge shift in church membership. So Congregationalism and Episcopalian churches lost membership. If I remember right, Congregationalism mainly was in like the New England areas. It was kind of like um, all the dudes in the town or all the people in the town went to that church and it sort of served as a um, law and order scenario for those towns. But those churches lose their membership. And so what we have is a rise in Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian church membership. And this is something that leads to a rise in spiritual egalitarianism. And I didn't know what egalitarianism was until I took my first master's class. So if you don't know what egalitarianism, it's sort of like a sense that everyone is equal. Everyone should be equal in a specific issue. So there was a rise in spiritual egalitarianism, a rise in the fact that everyone should be equal in the spiritual realm, whether you're white, black, well, maybe they didn't quite feel the black piece at the time, but 
mainly white males, regardless of land ownership or regardless of education, regardless of um, amount of time they've been alive. I, I mean, all these things, it was sort of thrown out the window and all people were equal and sort of even leads to women equality. And this is a little scary for some people and we'll talk about that more later. Um, so like the note says, all are equal in the eyes of God and all have an equal opportunity to gain interest and in, entrance into heaven. Um, for example, the Congregationalists needed a divinity degree. And that slide there that's covered up says few people could get that, okay? It was sort of like getting accepted into a college or something, and few people could get that. But Methodists created like an easy avenue for people to get in. Maybe not necessarily easy, but an avenue that allowed anyone with a supernatural call to preach to become a minister. Um, so that's, you know, you, you, you may or may not, I guess, but in my area where I live in Northeast Ohio, Northwest Ohio, I'm sorry, you often hear people saying, you know, God called me to be a minister in some of these churches and non-denominational churches and, and whatnot. And I mean, I guess you just take their word. I don't know, assuming they're doing it right and not trying to manipulate things. So that's something to think about here is that the Methodists, anyone could be a minister. And that was different for people to be able to be anything they wanted, maybe, is a way to look at it. So it was kind of the first time that the average person could become a minister. So more about it. These tent revivals are mainly camp meetings. People would flock to them from like all over, or rather the ministers would travel, but then people from the surrounding countryside would travel in to hear these ministers uh, speak. Um, if I remember right, Lyman, Ly Lyman, Lyman Beecher was one dude that was big about it. Um, there's a few others, but he's the one I, I just recently read about in the Shopkeepers Millennium. So we got that guy. Women and men are were allowed at revivals. So women and men together at these big meetings, religious meetings. Some people were a little unsure about that. And American Protestants forbade women to speak in church, but these new ministers allowed women a voice and opportunity. And if you put yourself back in 19th century, early 19th century America, the church was as much as a public gathering and meeting as maybe like a school board meeting would be today. And I, I really hope you can understand and put yourself in that position that for women to speak up in the presence of men who, who have some sort of authority or dominion over at least their homes or their government in the places that they live was groundbreaking. Like, I don't know what you could compare it to. Maybe, maybe like, uh, like, heck, I'm using an iPhone reference when most of the kids that are in high school probably watching this weren't even around when the iPhone came out, but something that sort of revolutionized a given area. And that's, that's spiritual egalitarianism here. Oh, I see I've cut off the top of this screen. Let me see if I can fix that real quick. And if I can't, well, then we will move on. Oh, look at that. Got it. But I think I have a crop. Nope, that's not the one. This is the one. It's got to be it. Yeah, that's the one. All right. We'll change our position. There she is. Got her. Maybe I'll make me a little smaller because I know no one really cares about me down in the corner. All right. We're set to go. Now, these spiritual revivals lead to something called the Benevolent Empire. And I'll tell you that if you research or do it much reading when it comes to 19th century newspapers, there's always things posted in there about all the re or like societies and things set up to aid people. So this, like I said, is directly a, a result from the, directly from the revivalism of the 19th century. Reform societies popped up all over the United States. It's a mix of reform, religion, and it turned to a powerful force in the United States. 
So it's sort of maybe where your church is responsible for caring for the people in the community or providing aid to them. Middle class women were a key part of this reform movement. And at this time, women were responsible for the moral maintenance of their homes and communities. That's what this is saying down where I'm blocked out. And their leadership marked a shift away from traditional women's roles. Okay. And I hope, I guess I'll, I don't know, I'll, I'll move to something that is important for us to talk about just in a, in a passing. When the United States was first created, you have people like Abigail Adams, right? Who often conversed with their husbands about politics. And this happened in many elite members' households in the, you know, the end of the, of the 18th century. There kind of arose a problem here is that the nation was getting very divided on political views, you know, like the late 17 and early 1800s. Who was, you know, it, I mean, I guess you could compare it to the Democrats and Republicans in the Biden and Trump election recently, is, is things were very polarized. And women were sort of asked to like, hey, can you just like back off? Can you just not get involved in public um, public arguments and whatnot? And how about instead, women, you just kind of, you know, hold these parties at your house so that we can create a place for people to get together and talk and, you know, have some sort of relationship so that our nation doesn't get so split apart that actually we fight again or we go to war or something like that against each other. And so women were sort of like the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the conductor of political conversation. They, sort, they created the venue. They created the, the evening. They hosted these things so that people, families, men, well, like women and men, husbands and wives could get together in elite circles in Washington or, or other higher up people and sort of work through these, these issues and keep sort of a peace. And you know, that peace kind of goes back to the house as well. well um, um, women, women ooh, ooh, I did, did not, not realize, realize we were getting, getting a loop, loop there. there. Let's, Let's shut, shut that audio off. Let's actually get rid of that audio. So these, these, uh, women were asked to stay at home and instead teach their children Republican values so that that way when they grow up, these children can be good citizens of the country and help continue the, the American way of life, right? So the most successful thing that came out of the Benevolent Empire is the Temperance Crusade. This starts here in the 1820s, right? And it lasts all the way up to prohibition. It sort of loses its zest maybe in like the late 19 or 1800s, like 1880, 1890. And you know, the, the nation itself gradual transition, gradually transitions to prohibition. And then the Anti-Saloon League comes in and, and then really gets, gets prohibition past the, the 18th amendment. Um, but the Temperance Crusade was the most successful part of the Benevolent Empire, most long lasting. In the 1820s, alcoholism had skyrocketed among adults. And, and I want you to think about this. We talked about those changes, those inner city, growth of inner city populations and industrialization at breakneck pace, right? If you study epidemiology, which some of you might be Facebook epidemiologists by now, but we'll see about that. Cities are dirty and many typhoid outbreaks and, and many um, dysentery, Oregon Trail lovers out there, comes into place and like it it's dirty there's diseases that just wipe through cities every so often water was not safe right but whiskey and beer kind of was it has the alcohol to sort of kill the germs off and so it's it's like the poor people who live with these dirty conditions are drawn to that and um I mean, heck, not even really poor people. It could have been many people who just lived in a position where the areas around their house may be dirty or the water they're accessing might be dirty. And so um, the other piece of that is that whiskey was cheaper than, the, than uh, or whisk, cheap whiskey made a staple in low and middle class homes. So whiskey itself, if you talk about um, the connection of, you know, the, the interior with the eastern coast or, or just the interior itself. You think about corn and all those things, uh, those grains and whatnot that are grown in sort of like the midwestern portion of the country or just, just to the west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, that's how you make 
beer and, and, and whiskey, right? So these things were easier to get at the time and the canals connected the, the United States. So it's just movements of things are, are happening at a faster pace and an easier pace. So intemperance. It was an impediment to maintaining order and morality in the Republic. This extends to other forms of vice, such as gambling or prostitution, um, and it essentially endangered family life. And maybe that's where the real issue shows up for some of these people is that, you know, think if a dude is getting drunk all the time, wasting his money, drinking, there's even this like spin on alcohol that it's the demon rum and it can possess your soul type of thing, right? And, and the demon that possesses the soul makes a man inability to control his faculties so he just shovels all his money to the to the saloon keeper and and the demon rum then the family doesn't get any money and so the children start to starve and go hungry and so it's like this idea that it's causing problems in society alcohol i hope that you're aware of saint patrick's day because that's where this next line comes into every year it's a time when college kids specifically and uh, many adults go out and use an excuse to get hammered, right? There is a cultural piece to that. There is a sort of a reason why St. Patrick's Day, an Irish day, is a day of drinking alcohol. And it's because the Irish people, when they moved to these cities, had this, this drinking culture among them, whether they're working long hours in factories or whatever, and, and trying to dole the pain away of those hard work of the hard work days. Um, but Irish Catholics specifically felt uh, felt like this was an intrusion intrusion on their cultural life, and it increased tension among ethnicities, classes, and religion. I mean, remember a lot of these Protestants living in the United States at the time had left. Catholic control or specifically left because of Catholic reasons. So just want you to be aware of those things and the, and the tie to, to Irish and, and drinking culture. Dum, 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 trouble in the benevolent empire. I really like this image here that you can barely see. Just that typical like beautiful landscape thrown in with some Indians with the sunlight hitting them just right. I wish I could be there now and not here where it's 35 degrees. But that's besides the point. Trouble in the Benevolent Empire. Instead of doing these social reforms, the Benevolent Empire kind of dips its toes into political issues and that proves to be detrimental to the Benevolent Empire. There was a movement against Indian removal, okay? Um, this movement against, let's see if I got a shortcut here. This movement against Indian removal kind of came down to the idea that the American people treating other human beings in a manner that is anti-American or at least something that would go against the constitution really did not sit well with a bunch of people. And so the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was met with fierce opposition by the Benevolent Empire. All right, let me get to, I wanna talk more about the Indian Removal Act and I don't have the note in here. So give me just a second. Okay, so the American Yacht specifically talks about how the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was met with fierce opposition from within the effective Native American communities as well as the Benevolent Empire. This dude, Jeremiah Everts, Everts, one of the leaders of the American board, he wrote a series of essays under the name William Penn, which you may have heard of, urging Americans to oppose removal, and here's why. He used the religious and moral arguments of the mission movement, but added a new layer of politics in his extensive, extensive in his extensive discussion of his oh boy guys i'm not doing well he used the religious and moral arguments of the mission movement but added a new layer of politics 
and his extensive discussion of the history of treaty law between the United States and Native Americans. So basically he's saying, we've made these treaties with these dudes before, but here we are violating these treaties. And so it's, it's just urging people that, look, your religions and your morals should be playing into this. But then also, you know, we, we said that we're going to do these things and, and we, we created treaties. And who are we if our treaties are pointless? Who can trust us? So it's something to think about. All right. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Anti-slavery and abolitionism. These revivals, they lead to an idea that slavery was the most God-defying of all sins, okay? And the most terrible blight on the moral virtue of the United States. Now, people had been in favor of, of abolition for a while. Um, some of those models were like gradual emancipation or slowly ending slavery. But we get something a little different, okay? We have this thing called, rat basically people radicalize this movement, okay? And they're aided by the northern free black population and middle class commitment to reform. This radicalized the anti-slavery movement, which is funny that an anti-slavery movement could be radicalized when today it seems like the worst thing America's ever done. But... Apparently, these people were radicals, which I guess maybe that's kind of the point in some history. It's only time will tell if they truly were on the right or the wrong, right? So, this transition, though, goes from abolitionism to immediatism. And I hope, if you can think through those words, immediately, immediate, immediateism, okay? Trying to get rid of slavery today, not over the next 20 years. Today, we end slavery. So abolitionism. They used a more gradual approach to ending slavery. Immediatism wanted slavery done now. Just talked about that. Um, these immediatists were attacked as harbingers of disunion. They were portrayed as a threat to American experiment of self-government. These dudes just wanted people to be treated right and end slavery. And maybe there was some economic or political underlyings there to make a jab at the South or get, establish some Northern dominance. But either way, we can say today we know slavery is wrong. And these dudes were on the right side of history here. Now, my favorite guy, which I don't know if I talk about him a lot here. Yes, I do. John Brown. John Brown is bad A, bad booty, whatever the word is you can fill in there. You, ha you have moral suasionists. They felt that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document, basically meaning that no matter what we wanted to do, that it within the Constitution, slavery is allowed. They wanted to actually end slavery in America. Um, they not only wanted to end slavery in America, they wanted to just start the whole thing over again, get rid of the Constitution, rip it up, burn it, tear it up, throw it out, whatever. And... Maybe that's why they're the harbingers of disunion. Uh, hey, you really do want to end the government. I don't know. Maybe that is something radical. Now, within these abolition and anti-slavery movements, you also have women gaining leadership roles. And then there's an example here. Abby Kelly was elected to the Business Committee of American Anti-Slavery Society. The ass. A-A-S-S. -S. They must not have been big into acronyms back then or else they would have avoided that one, I'm guessing. So, the shift from reform to resistance. These abolitionists aided runaway slaves. And so not only are they wanting to get rid of slavery, now they're like breaking the law, no matter how wrong the law is. But that again, is not sitting well with a lot of people. And the dude that we need to talk about is John Brown. And basically, I want to get you exactly the right story here. And I more know about John Brown when it comes to, to bloody or bleeding Kansas or whatever. Um, but John Brown, he truly was what you would think of as a radical. Like, 
going out and just trying to start fights, basically starting these movements, trying to create revolts and revolution and, and whatnot. Um, and today, was he a terrorist or was he a hero? I mean, you decide, but the dude was doing stuff to try to end slavery. Sure, he did it something in a way maybe people might view as an anti-Christian way, but he was trying to do things for a right. And so you be the judge. I don't know, maybe if you watch a comment, what do you think about John Brown? It should, should he be treated well or poor in history? I don't know, man. That's one of the great debates, I guess. All right, what do we got? What do we got? Oh yeah, we also have Frederick Douglass, who's one of those northern free blacks kind of pushing for this. Um, don't forget there was the Fugitive Slave Act, which basically meant you had to return runaway slaves to their owners, and people were violating that. That's where the, uh, the shift from resistance comes in down at the bottom. So there we have it. The moment we've all been waiting for. Maybe you have, I don't know, maybe you didn't even know it was in here. Women's rights in antebellum America. Anti being before, bellum, well, I don't really know what it means, but all together the word really means before the Civil War, okay? Um, so women's rights before the Civil War in America. Family and home was key to civic virtue and moral influence, okay? That was what women were supposed to treat and teach in their families. Civic virtue and moral influence. Pass it on to your kids. Women were expected to educate and maintain this virtue within their homes because, like I said earlier, it was the key to America being successful, having these attributes. Women were expected to be pious, religious, that's what that means, pure, while their husbands are out getting mistresses, i.e. Alexander Hamilton, right, if you've seen the musical. I digress. They were supposed to be submissive. They're supposed to be domestic and teach their children all these things. Barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen maybe is something we would say today. But maybe we wouldn't say it because it's not PC. I don't know, whatever. They were supposed to do all these things, right? And you get this cult of domesticity. In order to fill this role, uh, women pushed for access to education. They're like, hey, if you want us to do all these things, if you want us to teach our kids, we too need to be able to actually do these things, read, write, um, so on and so forth, right? So teach us how to do it. The defining moment when women were in, uh, of this, of women's rights, let's say, um, where it really kind of splinters into a women's rights movement was the Seneca Falls Convention. It starts at the World Anti-Slavery Convention, okay? Women showed up there but they were denied entry because they were women. And so it's kind of like ticks them off. And so they leave this anti-slavery group, I guess. But I mean, they still might have held with them the anti-slavery values, but they leave this group and they go to this place, Seneca Falls, New York, I believe. I'm, you would think, I, yeah, it's New York. They responded by organizing the Seneca Falls Convention. And what you have up there is the Seneca Falls Conve Convention, that little picture in the top right of your screen there. Um, so all of these things aside, I would really tell you, because we're gonna talk about them again, that I, that I like to focus on temperance, because it does play a big role later in, in American history. And plus that's what I studied for my master's. So of course I care about it. We have the anti-slavery movement, abolitionism, immediatism. Um, and then something I didn't quite hit hard, but again, Indian removal because the Indian relations does play a role, especially when it comes to manifest destiny or spreading West. So there you have it. That's the end. That's all I've got for you. That is the American yacht religion and reform um, lecture from Mr. Kretz's College Credit Plus class. I'll do the proverbial YouTube, like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, I know most of you guys are probably like forced to watch this thing. So you don't have to do that. I mean, really just hopefully I gave you a little low down touch up, whatever on this and wasn't too boring as I sit here and ramble on. 
but uh, tell your teachers, hey, I like that dude, give us more. But you don't have to. Yeah. Well, till next time, see ya. Oh, wait, I'm not editing this, that won't work.